Uh, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed uh, for uh, those kind comments. When you were quoting me, this is going to sound rather vain, and a sort of tingle down my spine, and I thought I shouldn't really be having a tingle down my spine uh, over my own words. Uh, and that is vanity of vanities at this uh, time of uh, celebrating uh, Shakespeare. Uh, but if that is Shakespeare, it should be, but it isn't. Um, but I have to say, they are my words. Um, that they are the beating heart, as I know everybody in this room, and the beating heart of the majority uh, of this nation. They are uh, common words uh, that we all share, common phrases that we all share, uh, and uh, we all uh, have that same belief uh, in freedom and, and democracy. Can I thank you, uh, Barry? Uh, we haven't met for some years now. He still looks as young as he ever did, um, and uh, I'd like to see you again. And also to thank all of you and Robert, of course, uh, for organizing this evening. It's great to be here in the Bruges Group. In fact, many years ago, I was a member of the Bruges Group uh, when it was uh, first formed. So thank you for your warm uh, welcome. Uh, can I also um, say hello to Roger? Do you know, I want to just put it on the record, I have huge respect and admiration uh, for Roger Helm. But I also have huge respect and admiration for every single UK voter in this country. And I want to distance myself from anyone that might suggest that people expressing their views in the ballot box, even though, even though those views may be at odds with some mainstream politicians, to suggest that somehow expressing that view is loony, uh, I think is an insult to everybody that believes in democracy. People are entitled to express their view through the ballot box, whatever that view is, without being uh, basically abused in public. Well, um, why am I here? Why did I resign uh, from a rather sort of minor job as deputy chairman of the International Conservative Party. It's a sort of non-job of non-jobs, to be fair. Uh, but um, the majority of people in this country have never had a say on Europe. Either they were born when we had the referendum, or they were born but weren't old enough to vote. Or they were born, they were old enough, they did vote, but uh, they didn't get exactly what they were expecting. Um, so I think there is a democratic deficit at the heart of the European question. I think there are millions of people out there who are the great disenfranchised, who need to be enfranchised. They want their voices to be heard on the left, on the right. They want to be heard. And I think it is absolutely wrong that they are being denied the referendum that we all want uh, to see. So it is not, it is about enfranchisement, it is about democracy, it is about the fundamentals of democracy. Those millions of people that have not had a say deserve a say, and at some point they will have that say. My own view is that we can put this off as mainstream politicians. We can deny people that say, that choice. But a day is coming, and it's coming very soon, when people will have that say. And I pay tribute uh, to the work of the Bruges Group and people, many people in this room, people like Christopher Gill, people like Stuart Wheeler, and, and others that I recognize that have worked very hard over many years to try and give people that choice. Now I have to say that uh, we've been watching the headlines over the last uh, two weeks and months. I think democracy itself is in peril across Europe. And it is all down to unelected ideologues pushing a vision of Europe that was never going to work, that will not work, and now is endangering democracy itself. We've seen the rise of the extreme left, the extreme right in Europe. I think that's likely uh, to increase. I didn't support the uh, latest bailout of the IMF. 
Why? Because it is an indirect bailout to the Eurozone, let's face it. There are, uh, of course, uh, some of our leaders will say, that, well, it's not a direct bailout of uh, a currency, but it is an indirect bailout because three Eurozone countries are going to receive a significant amount of money. And they are failing because they are members of the Eurozone, because they are part of a one-size-fits-all monetary policy. And of course, that mistake is possibly going to be repeated uh, through fiscal policies as well. So it is a bailout. It's an indirect uh, bailout. And I don't support those bailouts because I think it's doomed to fail. And what we should be doing is actually preparing ourselves for the most significant financial storm ever seen in global history. Rather than giving more money, pouring good money after bad, we should be buffering ourselves, protecting ourselves as a nation. And I have said this at senior levels. If we think, if we think the Eurozone is going to contract or collapse, and I think it will contract first, and then eventually possibly collapse. And can I just say, even as a Eurosceptic, it is not something that I want to see. Of course, 40% of our ex exports go to the Eurozone, but it doesn't matter about my wishful thinking. It doesn't matter about what I want or what certain politicians want. It's what's <coughs> likely to happen. And if there is a good chance that the Eurozone is going to fail, then it is incumbent upon all leaders in this country to prepare <coughs> ourselves and protect this nation from that coming uh, firestorm, that financial firestorm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> if we think um, the euro is going to fail, we have to prepare rather than being in denial. And pouring more money, good money after bad, as I say, is not the way uh, to do it. <coughs> Now, of course, a lot of people will say that Europe doesn't matter in people's lives. Why does the conservative so-called centre-right, although, you know, I regard myself as a mainstream conservative, I think um, actually wanting to have control of immigration and migration, and wanting to have our own country run its own affairs, to return sovereignty to our nation, to have an independent United Kingdom, is actually mainstream thinking. It's not extreme thinking. It's actually the thinking of the majority of people down the Dog and Duck pub, or in your high street, or on the, or, or on the checkout. And there is something also, what I call the European missing <coughs> When people actually start to see the impact of Europe in their daily lives, and it does impinge and intrude on our lives every single day. But as that becomes more manifest in the experience of individuals, then Europe polling currently at number nine will soon go up that chart to about number two or number three. And when you look at the impact of migration on people trying to get their children into school, even in places like Winchester, if you heard Radio Force some weeks ago, where you have a family where one child is in a school, they live in the catchment area, but because of EU migration, they're unable to send that other child to the same school and they have to be carted off several miles uh, down the road. When people, more people start to experience that, and when people start to have even longer views at their local GP, then that then is that missing link. That link, that gap comes together, people intellectually and in their experience start to say, this has gone too far, enough is enough. And I think, apart from the immigration issue, EU migration is something that we will uh, have to face uh, very, very soon. So, we can talk as politicians about elections. We can talk uh, as politicians uh, about philosophy and even ideology and policies and people. But ultimately, ultimately, if we don't control our own destiny, if we don't control our own nation, and if we don't protect ourselves from the coming storm, then we will be held responsible. And I've said this to very senior colleagues. It's not about winning the next election, although if we don't protect ourselves, I don't think we'll be winning many elections in the future. It is about actually putting our nation first, putting our country first, our party second, and our careers last. And it is that order 
This country needs strong leadership. We are going in the wrong direction. We need to change direction. There is a political consensus that is in denial about what is going to happen. Now, I may be wrong. Let's hope I'm wrong. But if we do see the biggest financial collapse in history, if we do see the biggest uh, financial collapse in Europe, then we need to be taking action today rather than denying it. And all I see is finance ministers across Europe putting off the inevitable, hoping beyond hope that somehow it will get better. But you cannot have a single political entity running a variety of disparate countries across Europe. You cannot have a single monetary policy that fixes a particular interest rate for one economy when it doesn't suit another economy, in that, uh, in perhaps in Southern Europe or in other places. So my view is that Greece will eventually uh, leave the euro, probably sooner rather than later, but it won't be the first, uh, and it certainly uh, it will be the first, it certainly won't be uh, the last. So my view is that um, there should really be a meeting of minds across the political parties to say we need to protect our nation from what is coming. I don't expect that to happen. There should then be a meeting of minds within the Conservative Party, the governing party, or at least the majority part, part, partner within the governing party. A meeting of minds to say if this is likely to happen, then we need to protect ourselves. Those discussions, I don't think, are going on. Of course, the Treasury is saying there are contingency plans. I think they're probably marginal contingency plans. Um, so what we need is a referendum in order to set the right direction uh, once and for all in this uh, country. I will continue to campaign uh, for that referendum. I wrote an article, I think, last uh, September for the Telegraph when I suggested having a, uh, and I'm including a two-step uh, a referendum, perhaps having a referendum uh, with a list, a definitive list of powers that we want to see returned uh, from Europe, and then if uh, Europe didn't deliver within, let's say, a two-year period, we would then move to uh, an in or out referendum. This is, I think, the first time publicly I've said it. I have to say, I think that times have moved on, and I can tell you tonight that I I'm now somebody that doesn't think that is satisfactory and that I would like to see an in or out referendum. Uh, because I don't think... <laughs> because I don't think for all the people that are doing some excellent work in my own party on um, trying to uh, reform Europe and trying to get powers back, I just don't think that's ever going to happen. Uh, I just think that... Um, <laughs> We are so far in uh, that it's going to be very, very, very difficult to actually uh, get powers back. And I think it will be marginal, it will be, um, the, the response from Europe will be very timid, it will be certainly very reluctant. Um, and I think that we need to have that democratic franchise, that mandate from the British people uh, to actually uh, say to Europe, I'm sorry, the British people have spoken, we serve the British people as elected members of parliament and we're listening to their voice and we are going to now fully renegotiate re our relationship with Europe. Of course that doesn't mean we don't have bilateral treaties or multilateral <coughs> treaties, whatever it might be. We don't, of course we're going to cooperate, of course we're going to trade, work with uh, Europe on the environment, on defence issues, etc, etc. Um, but I don't think, um, again wishful thinking, Wishful thinking that somehow the euro is going to survive. Wishful thinking that somehow Europe is going to change. Wishful thinking that somehow uh, Europe is going to reform. Wishful thinking that somehow Europe will give us powers back. They will not. The only answer is an in or out referendum putting the British people first. Thank you.